place that your love can't reach. Lord, you've reached down and you've touched each and every one of us. And Lord, we thank you for that. Oh Lord, how is it that we could even think to continue but a moment longer without knowing the great I am? Oh, the Lord of all. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in you we place our trust, our hope, and our future. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Happy New Year! Who ever thought <laughs> that we would be in 2015? Man, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken much better care of myself. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Wow. But what an opportunity. What an awesome time. I, I'm just thrilled uh, that, that you guys are out tonight and that you made it through and that we're here. What an exciting turning of the page, if you will. And it's a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. If you don't have a Bible, put your hand up. One of the guys will bring you one. We're going to kind of be moving around in a lot of different places and through. It'd probably be easier to take notes and look it up later uh, and, and, and to try to keep up with me. But we're going to be using... 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is kind of our anchor for tonight. We're going to be using that from which to spring from. So let's ask the Lord to bless this time in our study as we bring honor and glory to Him. Heavenly Father, God, we thank You. And Lord, may it be that as we would look to Your Word, that as we would look to Your truths, that Lord, we would do so in such a way that it would bring about a new hope, a newness with a new year. Lord, there's not one of us here that doesn't recognize the changing of time. And, and Lord, hopefully look at it as something that is good. It's a new year. And in you, Lord, we are promised newness. So may it be that as we would approach this this evening, Lord, we would come to the place that you would have us to be new in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, ready or not... It's 2.15. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't anything that we could do to keep it from coming. Even though many of us are happy to see it go, there's some that probably did better than others in 2.14 and are speculating on 2.15, not knowing if it will be as good. So the interesting thing is, though, is that as we would look to 2.15 and look at that which is new, the question is, is what is coming? Is it going to be new or will it be just a repeat of what we had last year? Boy, I hope not, huh? You know, I love turning the calendar. I mean, I really do. I love the idea of something starting fresh and new. I like the idea of being able to take and just say 214 is over and everything that happened in it is a memory. It's in the past, whether it was good or bad or whatever. It's in the past now. Everything is made new in the calendar event of 215. It'll take me to about May to stop writing it on the checks. But other than that, here it is. The goal, well, for the new year, to make things better. I would hope that already that you've thought about how it is that you can do things, make things be better this year now that we're in it than you were last year. How that happens in the hearts and the minds of a lot of people, we apply very often at this time of the year resolutions. Now be honest, did anybody here make resolutions? No? Oh, come on, good. Okay, there's, okay. Be, and, and you know what? If you didn't make one, you thought about it. You thought about the things that you did last year that you want to do better this year, and you either made a promise to yourself or a promise to somebody else, or you've thought about what you could, would, and should do this year to make it better than last year. Resolutions are a part of a culture. They're a part of who we are because in reality, who doesn't want to do better? Does anybody in here not want to have a better year this year than last year? No, I really like last year. I think I'll do worse this year. I just really... <laughs> Probably not. And so what happens is, is in this aspect of making resolutions, I come to find out that there are actually people that most likely are being paid by our tax dollars to study New Year's resolutions. <laughs> 
So because we paid for the study, we might as well look at some of their findings. Are you ready? The top 10 New Year's resolutions go in this particular order. Number one, to lose what? Weight. Weight. How did you guys know that one so quick? I I could have said lose money and you didn't know. To lose weight. The second one is to get organized. The third one is to spend less and save more. Fourth is to enjoy life to the fullest. Number five is to stay fit and healthy. Number six, learn something exciting. Number seven, to quit smoking. Number eight is to help others in their dreams. And number nine is to fall in love. Number 10 is to spend more time with family. Now, it's interesting because statistically, they say that 45% of Americans, 45% of Americans will make a New Year's resolution of a combination of one or more of these particular resolutions. Now, you might have made one that was different, but 45%, almost half of the Americans that are out there in this country had made some sort of resolution. Now, it's interesting, though, because there's also a number of 38%, and it looks like that's the majority of the folks here tonight that absolutely refuse to make resolutions. You are the anti-resolute. I refuse to resolve and to make a resolution about anything. I'm just going to stay the way that I am. No, it's no. But what's even sadder is that the number of people that successfully achieve their resolution, it's 8%. 8%. Of those that never even get out of the gate, it's three times higher. It's 24% that make the resolution and just fail right out the bat. The categories, for the most part, and these add up to more than 100% because it's the, it's the multiple resolutions by the same, same group, but self-improvement makes up about 47%. Weight-related resolutions, 38%. Money-related, 34 Relationship, 31%. Amongst that, 39% of those that make resolutions are in their 20s. 14% are 50 and above. The failure rate for the 50-year-olds is much higher than the 20... 20-some because you can't teach old dogs new tricks. We talk a good fight. We just don't have enough fight left in the bark to make it work, right? There you go. Yeah. Of those that make resolutions and stick with them, and remember, we started with 45% and then we went down to 8%, and so now we're talking about a very small percentage of people that actually follow through. Of those that do follow through, and make it past the week, it's about 75%. Yeah, it, it, one week. After six months, less than 46% actually follow through of the 8% that made it in the end. So this whole resolution thing just really doesn't hold a lot of merit to it. It really doesn't carry a lot of, a lot of weight. And, and the interesting thing about it is, is that it's all stuff that people want to do that's good for them good for us, and yet we can't follow through. And yet we can't keep our word even to ourselves, let alone to those that we would make the promise to, even when it's a benefit to ourselves. Why do we fail? Well, I think it's real simple. I think we fail because it's our plan. I think when it's our plan, because one of the things that I noticed that was absent from the top 10 in any of these that I've looked at over the course of the last few years is there wasn't any category that said to draw closer in my relationship with God. There wasn't any of them that said that I want to take and, and, and become more involved in my relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that didn't make the top 10. Can you believe that? But yet the failure rate in itself, I think, speaks to the fact that when we try to make and achieve a plan that is ours, that is absence of the power of God in our life, then chances are our plan's not going to work, but we stand a much better chance if it's God's plan. So with that in mind, what I want to do tonight, and we're not going to go into a long 
in-depth study. Tonight I just want to touch on a few things. We're going to have a little time of prayer at the end to just, just kind of cement the things in our heart, and then we're just going to celebrate the fact that it's, hey, it's New Year's Day, 2015. Woo! <laughs> I even got one of those purr things. No, I don't. What I want to do is take these top ten and I want to look at them in light of the spiritual connotation. I want to, I want to look at them as, as how would it be if we were to take and, and to make application of God's plan, God's word, the spirit of God in our lives, and how we could apply it, oh, more in a spiritual sense than a physical and a practical, to this top ten of resolutions. And I believe that we find the answer to what it is that we're looking for in that verse that we studied just recently on Sunday mornings in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that what the resolution's all about? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what we're trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve the old things passing away and all things becoming new. We don't want to be like the old man. We want to be like the new man or the new woman. We want to walk in these ways. And here we have what I believe is the absolute, I'm not even going to call it a secret, I'm going to call it the, the key to success. It's not a secret. It's written, written right in God's Word. What does it say? If we want to become new from that which was old, we have to be what? in Christ we have to be in Christ because it's within Christ and being in Christ that is going to allow us the power that we need in our lives to be over to be able to overcome so here's what I want us to do we're going to look at these 10 now you may not need all 10 of these you may not need these 10 you may have a whole list of your own but I want you to kind of look at the same process and we're not going to talk about it in the light that you might think we'll have to wait and see but let's start with that first one lose weight Ugh. that is the number one that people like to put themselves to I want to lose weight well you know what I know that these concern, for the most part, the physical aspects of weight and the effects on our body, but what I want to talk about is I want to talk about losing the weight of that which burdens not our physical body, but our hearts and our souls and our minds. I want to talk about casting off the weight that is brought upon us from the burden of sin that we continue to carry when we don't have to. You see, what happens is, is I believe that we can carry sin, even as believers, even as Christians, to the degree that it weighs us down a whole lot more and makes us heavier than God wants us to be. I know a lot of heavy Christians. You know what I mean? People who are Christians, but they have heavy hearts, that they have a heart that is weighted down with sin, that they've got this issue in their life, or they've got these areas in their life that's causing them to be held back from the blessings of God. And because of that, literally, it's like they're walking around carrying a sack of cement. It's extra weight that need not be there. One of the greatest weights that can come upon us has to do with what is the most difficult sin to forgive. There's a sin that's very difficult to be forgiven of. It's the sin that goes unconfessed. You see, it's the unconfessed sin in our life that has a tendency to weigh us down. And because we haven't asked for through confession and, and, and asked for forgiveness, we haven't received forgiveness. And we haven't, therefore, accepted that forgiveness in our life to the degree that we're no longer under the burden. So here's what I want to tell you tonight. If you're carrying around too much weight tonight, make it one of your resolutions if it comes in the form of sin that's unconfessed, to confess the sin. To be free from the burden. To allow God to have it. To ask for, through confession and repentance, the forgiveness that comes and the liberty that comes through Christ Jesus so that you don't have to be overweight when it comes to your sin. Now, there's another kind of weight that we can carry around, and this is one of those that is very, very sad. It's the weight of sin that we carry that God doesn't assign to us anymore. It's that sin that we've been forgiven of because we've asked for it, but we haven't accepted the fact that God has forgiven us. Or, even worse, 
we haven't forgiven ourselves. There may be sin in your life right now that you're, you're carrying around. It's something that you have taken to God. He has told you, being faithful in His promise to forgive you of that sin, and yet you're still walking and carrying it. Guys, I love the fact that Psalm 103.12 tells us that it's as far as the east is from the west that He has removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? They don't touch. You see, there's, there's no way for them to run into each other. As you continue to go east and you continue to go west, you don't ever meet. And it says that God has taken our transgressions, God has taken our sin, and He has cast them as far as the east is from the west. That's pretty cool. How come I keep remembering it? How come I keep carrying it around? How come I keep picking up that which isn't any longer mine to carry? And so when it comes to the new year and the first resolution, well, lose the weight. Lose the weight of sin by confessing and then walk in the promise of God's forgiveness. If you've been forgiven, act like it. Act like it. Number two, getting organized. The greatest challenge to getting organized is setting priorities for the things that are truly important. And while we can use all kinds of modern gadgets and I've got reminders and cell phones and iPads and instant messaging and, and, and alarms that go off on you. You know when I get that alarm for my appointment it's normally like, like two hours after the appointment? I haven't quite figured out how to program that thing yet. But the idea is, is that it's a matter of taking and, and, and making sure that we're not wasting that which God has given us on the things that have no value. It's a matter of prioritizing the things in our life. Now, we can take and be disorganized in such a way that we spend an awful lot of time, as we talked in message not too long ago, dealing with the urgent but unimportant rather than that which is truly important. Colossians 3, 2 and 4 tells us to set our mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, we can organize our lives in such a way that we can look forward to that which we've been promised. We can look forward to heaven. We can look forward to God's provisions. We can look forward to all the promises that He's made to us, even in the midst of the storm, as we just sung. In the middle of the storm, I am holding on. I am. I'm holding on. And we can hold on to that promise. Number three, to spend less, save more. Sounds good, right? Less filling tastes great. No, wrong commercial. Whereas most would equate this purely to money, I think it goes far beyond that, and it talks about that element that we constantly are reminded of, of time, talent, and treasure. That which we are given. I want to spend less time on the things that don't matter and save more time for the things that do. I want to really be able to look at how it is that I can save that time. Have you ever had that day where no matter how fast you went, everything slowed you down? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, Steph's left the house from time to time. She said, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Four and a half hours later, she comes back, and I just look at her, and she just goes, you have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I've been there. It's like you go here, it's supposed to be a five-minute trip, and by the time you're done, you come back three weeks later. You don't even know where you've been. Second, I want to spend less of my energy and talent on things that have no eternal significance, and I want to save that energy and that talent and that, that blessing that God has given me for Him. Thirdly, I want to spend less of what the Lord gives me in the way of resources. I want to not waste them on, on things that are frivolous and things that are unimportant and things that have no significance. I want to take and spend those resources on things that produce not only godliness, but, but produce eternal significance to the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, I want to spend less and I want to save more of that which God has blessed me with for His purpose and for His kingdom. Then I want to enjoy life, number four, to the fullest. Boy, now that's kind of a blanket statement. Enjoy life to the fullest. I mean, how do we get to that point? How do we, how do we enjoy life? Well, I tell you what, I had a great example of this tonight. 
in just several conversations that I had with folks before the service. It's wonderful about how people were, are sharing to, with me some of the things that are going on in their lives and some of the blessings and some of the praise reports and some of the struggles and, and all of these different things. And it, and it just reinforces the fact that do we see our lives as a constant struggle in which we are always under attack or in need of something, or do we recognize that God is directing our paths? I love Psalm 37, 23. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. John 10 and 10 says that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, Jesus speaking, that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. You see, that's the promise of God. Do we want to live life to the fullest? Do we want to understand and really be able to embrace and enjoy our life? Then we have to recognize that everything that God allows us to go through is purposed. It's purposed. We're not here by accident. We're not here by coincidence and by happenstance. And it isn't, it isn't just dumb luck if something good happens and bad luck if something bad happens. It's all orchestrated by God, which means in every single step that I take, whether it's uphill, downhill, sideways, forward, or backwards, whatever step I take, God is ordering my steps. Which means wherever I arrive at, there's a purpose in me being there. There's a purpose for us to be there. And so when we start thinking about how do I really want to enjoy this year? How do I really want to take it and and get more enjoyment out of my life? Understand, your life is on purpose. It's on purpose. It's not a mistake. It's not an accident. God is ordering the steps that you take. If you step into a place you don't want to step, God knows. He brought you there because there's somebody there that needs that the witness that you have of Jesus Christ in your life to be shown, shown as a light into the darkness of that place. I get to walk into a lot of places I would never take myself just because of what God has me doing. I don't like walking into the hospital. I don't like walking into the, the, the cardiac ward or to the cancer ward. or to the, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I don't like that. But you know, I know that God's got me there for a reason. I know that He has purposed for me to be there as much as He has purposed for the individual that is there. And it's not so that we can just go in and strengthen each other, which we will through prayer and through consolation. But the reality is is that the reason that we're there is to be able to strengthen and to be able to console and to be able to lead those that are in the darkness to the light. What a cool thought. Let me ask you a question. Be honest. How many of you would go into the darkness on purpose or would you try to avoid it? Be honest. I try to avoid it. I don't want to go in there on purpose. So you know what God does? Is he makes a way for us to go in because he wants us to be in there because we're his representatives. So do we want to really enjoy life? Then recognize that our steps are ordered by the Lord. Staying fit and healthy. Yeah, that's it. (sighs) <sighs> my favorite subject. Staying fit and healthy. I've been really fit and healthy lately. I've been trying to fit everything unhealthy into my mouth over the last few days. It's been working out great. We've got it all around the house. Thank you very much for blessing me with that. Do not bring any more. Yeah. The old saying, no pain, no gain is true, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to take and gain in the area of being healthy, of being fit, then you're going to have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to work at it. It's going to take a lot of extra effort. You're going to have to take and and, and force your, your mind and your body especially into different types of situations to where it has to perform in such a way that it doesn't want to. My hardest struggle at the gym is before I get out of bed in the morning. I mean, it is. My wife will tell you. I mean, I'll lay there and I'm like, if I don't get up, I ain't going. If I get up, there's a good chance I'll make it. Psalm 1 gives us some indication, though, because not only do we have to go put 
the effort into it, but one of the other things that we have to do in order to be able to stay fit and to stay healthy is we have to stay away from that which is unfit and unhealthy. You with me? We have to take and separate ourselves out. We have to take and realize that we need to move ourselves out of and away from the things that cause us and will lead us into being unhealthy. I have to stay out of the kitchen because there's still too many things laying on the counter. There's cookies and there's, there's these little, little nuts that are coated with sh wheat, sugar and honey and there's baklava and there's like, who would do that to me? Bring baklava to my house. And then they just sit it on the counter and it just sits there and oozes honey all over the county and, and counter and chocolate and somebody has to clean it up and you, you gotta <laughs> Psalm 1 says blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates night and day he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, listen, shall prosper. I like that. So you want to stay fit, you want to stay healthy, you got to stay next to the river. You got to stay rooted next to the flow. You got to be like that tree that's planted by the water to where you're going to bear fruit. You've got to take and remove yourself away from the things that are going to cause you to drag down and to cause you to be unfit and unhealthy. Number six, learn something exciting. <sighs> You know what, the older I get, the less I want to learn. Anybody else relate to that? It's like, it's, it's like I, you know what, when I had to learn, I had to learn. Now that I don't have to learn, I don't want to know. Every once in a while, my wife will be reading something very fascinating, and she'll say, oh, honey, come here, look at this, you need to know this. And I'll say, no, I don't. No, I, I, I don't have any brain capacity for that. I have no RAM memory left for that. I don't want to learn a whole new... Oh, but, but listen to this. This is fantastic. This guy is a genius. Well, I already then know that I'm way outmatched. I don't want to learn the stuff that this guy's talking about. She came to me once. She had this book that she'd been reading for about six months. She says, I've read this book six times. I still don't know what it says. It's wonderful. I said, what are you talking about? She said, this, this guy is so smart. I have no idea what he's talking about. Come here, look at this. Read this. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You've been reading it for six months. You've read it six times. If I touch that, I'm just going to burst into flames. I can't deal with that. We want to learn something exciting. How many times have I said that we don't fail because of what we know, but we fail because of what we don't know? Second Peter chapter 1, it says, To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen. Peter's opening. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him being Jesus who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In this introduction in 2 Peter, the writer saying, here's the thing, everything we need. You want to learn something exciting? Let me ask you a question. What do you need tonight? What do you need for 2015? What do you need in relationship to the things that you don't know, that you don't have, that if you could learn, it would excite you to know and to have that information on board, to have that knowledge on board, to have that wisdom on board, to be able to say, now I know what I'm going to do with that. Would that excite you? It says that the knowledge that we have through God's Word of Jesus Christ provides us all, everything, that we need for life and godliness. 
That's a pretty good promise. And then it backs it up and says, oh, and in addition to that, there are also exceedingly and great and precious promises beyond that. How many times have we talked about the fact that there is a resolution, a solution, a promise for everything that we need in our life that's given to us in Scripture? But if we don't know that it's in there, we're going to fail. You want to learn something exciting? Make it a habit to be in God's Word. Make it part of your resolution to say, I'm going to learn everything that I can about what God has to say in these areas of my life. I'm going to search it out. I'm going to become a student of that problem in my life and the resolution that God has in His Word in order to learn and to be excited about what God's doing in my life. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Because you've come across that. You've had that moment of revelation. There's been that situation where you've been sitting here and you've had a question and you've had something go through your mind and either on the radio or through a, 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 a sermon that you're listening to online or you're sitting here in church or you're talking to a brother. All of a sudden the answer comes out and you go, there it is. What I've been looking for. The answer. And we get excited. God wants us to be excited every single day because he's providing to us the answers that we need for all life and godliness. And it's provided in there. So you want to be excited about things? You want to learn something exciting? Work on that aspect of knowing who Jesus Christ is, because in him are all the answers for life and godliness. Number seven. Oh, they had to quit smoking. Not picking on the smokers in here. We're going to talk about quitting of bad habits and destructive behaviors, because that's really what it amounts to. See, regardless of how long we've been walking with the Lord, there are always going to be aspects of our life, there are always going to be behaviors and attributes and things that we do in our life that we need to change. There's always going to be that thing that the Holy Spirit still wants to work on in our lives, that still wants us to take and to turn that over. There's going to be that thought process. There's going to be that habit. There's going to be that behavior. There's going to be that, ah, you know, that thing. It's the things that we've struggled with. They show up in our personal life. They show up in our character. And the fact is, is we know that we need to get rid of them. In Galatians 5 and 16, it tells us that if we walk in the Spirit, that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so, do not do the, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And the apostle, in, in writing to the church in Galatia, he says, guys, here's the deal. If you want not to fulfill the flesh, if you don't want to do the things that you don't want to do, if you want to quit the bad habits and quit the destructive behaviors, then the only way that that's going to happen is not by overcoming them in the flesh. Now be honest, and you don't have to put your hand up, you just need to be honest with yourself, and God is watching. How many times have you tried to quit some sort of bad habit on your own in your flesh and failed? Yeah. It's like, ugh. I'm just going to get a faster run at it this time. I'm just going to take a bigger leap. I'm just going to, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Oh, I'll blew it again. Okay, I'm going to try this time. I keep going week by week by week. You know, it's like I'll, I'll set a goal for myself or something, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, I'll start next week. Mondays are great for that. It's okay, I'm going to do it Monday. And by Tuesday or Wednesday, you blow it. And you think, okay, I'll start next, next Monday. I'll start off. Because you've got to have this. It's the same process. We try, we fail, we try, we fail in our own flesh, in our own means. But it says that if we walk in the Spirit, and this is that aspect of being in Christ again, that we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. The same writer writing to the church in Philippi, it's the Apostle Paul, says, I know how to be broke. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I know how to be full. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then in verse 13 of chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, I can do some things, oh, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Are there bad habits? Are there things that you know that you need to quit? Are there things that you want to un understand? If you've tried in your flesh and you've failed, that's the pattern. That's the pattern. 
But what liberty, what, what grace, what assistance do we have by walking in the Spirit and relying on the Spirit of God in, in, in Jesus Christ in which we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us? What an awesome outlook. Number eight is to help others. And it says in their rendition, in their dreams. To help others succeed, to help others and to promote that which is in others. And one of the greatest gifts that we've been given in our relationship with Jesus Christ is the liberty and the freedom and the ability to help other people. Now here's the thing. There's a lot of things that we can do to help folks. I mean, we can physically help folks, all right? I mean, I, I, I like being able to, to catch that person that's in the moment of physical need, you know, where they're trying to lift something out of a grocery cart or something like that. I mean, I love being able to walk up and say, can I help you with that, all right? And be able to help put it. Costco is a great place to do that. If you want to bless people's socks off, just hang out around Costco because everything comes in a 55-gallon drum, all right? And you've always got that person out there trying to load that 88-pound bag of dog food in the, in the back of their car and they can't get out of the car. You just bless somebody's socks off. So we can do that. We know that we can go out and we can help people in those ways. We know that there's the ability to, to be able to do that. But the other way that is so far superior that we have of being able to help people, we have the knowledge of the Savior of the world. We have the key to eternal life. We have the solution to everything that ails whoever it is that is in need of our help at that moment in the form of being able to introduce them to Jesus Christ. But we have to be willing to do this based on love. We have to be willing to do this based on the fact that we do it not in our own strength, not for our own purposes, not for our own elevation, but because of our love for Christ, really because we have, as the Apostle says in Galatians 2 and 20, that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And then in Acts 20 and 34. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. And I have sworn to you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. What he's talking about here is that, guys, you realize that we have to take care of. We have an obligation to take care of and to, to bless those that are less fortunate than we are. But listen to what he says here in the end. He says, and remember, and this wasn't his words. These were the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, when it comes to receiving blessings, when it comes to giving to somebody else, it, it, there is really truly something about meeting a need, isn't there? Isn't it just something that is just so cool when you know that somebody needs something and you're able to just provide it and you're able to be able to just hook somebody up with whatever it is that they needed at that particular instance? It could be something very small. But you know what I've, I've found more than anything else is that the blessing that we receive in return for that as it pertains to what is good for our heart is always superior to the effort that we had to put into it in order to promote that blessing. Isn't it true? Don't you get more out of it? Haven't you just turned around and helped somebody and just done such, such, the, such a little thing, but yet you just feel like, wow, that was so cool. I got to help that person. Number nine, fall in love. Oh. Isn't it amazing that falling in love is number nine out of ten? <laughs> Everybody wants to fix everything about themselves first before they would go out and try to seek to fall in love with anybody because they don't figure they're lovable before they get to the point of losing weight and quitting bad habits and doing all that stuff. But every person ever born has an innate desire to love and to be loved. We have this within us. We want to be able to love someone and to be able to place our affections in and upon somebody else. And we also want to have that reciprocation of receiving love from someone else. We need that in order to really be a whole person within our lives. And yet, what 
we see given to us in the world is such a perversion of what true love really is. I mean, this, this idea of what the world holds up as being love is anything but. If we really want to know what it is to fall in love in the most pure sense of the word, what we, word, what we need to do is we need to look at the one who loved us first. In Romans 5 and verse 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the un." godly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die but god demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. If we really want to take and understand the aspect of how it is to love, then we need to recognize the love that's already been poured out upon us. Let's back up from love and just go to like first okay let's go to like what does it take to like somebody i mean what does it take to be attracted to somebody in the realm of oh i like that person normally what it means is that there has to be some sort of mutual attraction it doesn't have to be between the sexes i'm not talking about physical attraction i'm talking about some mutual interest some sort of 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 common ground for us to build a relationship on before there would even be a reason for us to engage long enough to be able to say yeah i met i met ron i like ron there has to be something that we have in common to get to that place of like not only if we're going to go anywhere beyond that place of like, but even to establish and to maintain like, there has to be reciprocation, right? I mean, if I like you and therefore I do something for you and every time I see you, you allow me to continue to do something for you and you never do anything for me, chances are our like relationship is going to fall apart after a while. You've been in those kind of relationships, haven't you? This is kind of a one-way street here. Things are not going real well. I'm the giver, they're the taker. That's the way they like it. It seems to work for them. This is what's so crazy about this. If we're going to get to the point to where we actually look at someone and we say that we love them, it's normally going to be based on the fact that we have placed our trust and of value in that relationship there is reciprocation going back and forth there's a mutual respect a mutual consent a mutual benefit to the relationship that now has gone past like to the standard of love which connects on a much higher and brings with it a much much higher responsibility doesn't it? if you just tell somebody you like them the relationship really isn't all that yeah, I mean, you don't have to get up at 2.30 in the morning and go bail somebody out if you just like them. You know what I mean? But if you tell somebody you love them and the phone rings at 2.30, you got to get up. There's more responsibility that goes with love, isn't there? Right? Be careful who you love. <laughs> when we were enemies, we had nothing to give to Christ. We gave nothing to Christ. If anything, we hated everything that He stood for, and yet He still loved us. And so if in this year, if we really want to find love, if we really want to, to understand this concept of love, one of the best ways for us to approach 215 is to make a resolution again to, to understand and to work on this relationship with the one that was able to demonstrate love that is off the chart. Why would I go look at love as it's given to us and manifested in the movies or in the media or in the, the the tabloids or in our representation of what's going on in the world boy that really lasts doesn't it no we need to go to the author to the originator 
to the one who loved us when we absolutely were as unlovable as we could be. Number 10, this is where we'll wrap up. To spend more time with family. I got to tell you what, that is one of my resolutions. It is. It's been one of my resolutions for the last 25 years. Every year, to try to spend more time with family. The idea not to get bogged down in doing the things again that are not important and to then sacrifice family because of it. And you know, I, I know that for the most part it's, it's easier at, at this point in time and I'm going to kind of make a switch. And even though there is, is a true assignment of responsibilities in both camps, this one probably belongs to the men more than it does the women. I think it's probably why it's number 10. Men finally slipped one in right at the end. I mean, after all, Scripture says that as a man, I am supposed to support my family. I'm supposed to provide for my family. As a man, I am worse than an unbeliever if I don't. That's what Scripture says. Scripture says that the man does not, that does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. But the problem is, is that the provision of what I, what I make and what I give to my family is really where the definition needs to be clarified. Because when it comes to provision, are we talking about safety and security and, and, and resources and, and, and shelter and food and all of that type of thing? Because if that's the case, then it's real easy for me to take and to use that as the means by which I really take and avoid fulfilling what is the true number one responsibility in the form of provision. And that is, is am I leading my family to the Lord? Now, we can talk about quality time versus quantity time. We can talk about the need to vacation. We can talk about the need to get away and to just have fun and to just play. And everything can't be uh, 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 all serious all the time. No. There needs to be the opportunity to be able to have all of that interaction. As a matter of fact, hopefully in the next, next few weeks, you guys won't see us around as much because we're going to go play for a while with our kids that just graduated college. And you're not going to know where we're at. We're not going to tell you because then you would call us and you'd bug us. No, just yeah, we are. <clears throat> It'll be warmer where we are. Uh -huh. But here's the thing. If the time that I spend with my family is going to have any value to it at all, the end result needs to be that it's time spent leading them to the Lord. Can we have fun in the meantime? Absolutely. Can we have fun doing that? Absolutely. But if I'm going to give up anything, I can't give up and relinquish the responsibility that I have when it comes to this desire to spend time with my family. In Proverbs 22 and 6, it says that we're to train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It means that my first priority has to be when I'm spending time with my family is to make sure that they're being brought up in the things of the Lord. And if I've done that, then it is truly quality time. It is truly time that is well spent. Now, can it be all the time? I mean, I, I, I almost get saddened when I hear about how it is that the only time that the dad spends with the kids is to sit down and have a Bible study with him. I'm glad he's doing it, but he needs to play baseball with them too. So the question becomes very simple. How do you want this year to go? Do you want it to be truly a new year? Do you want it to be new for you and new for the things around? Do you want to make some resolutions? Well, you know, like I said, you can take some of these or you can leave them. You can make some up of your own. You can do whatever you want with it. If you're one of those anti-resolutes, that's okay. You can just pray about it. We'll see where you come out. But take into consideration as many of these as you need to, but do so with the understanding that God is the author of change. And then go back and read our verse in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. 
we can become new and improved in 2015. My hope, my prayer, is that you'll embrace everything that the Lord has for you this year. Walk in newness. Accept all that God has for you and all that the Spirit would lead you in. And have an incredible year. Happy New Year. God bless you guys. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, may it be that as we would come to this place of just recognizing that which you would have for us in our lives. There's so many promises that we see in your word. It does give us the opportunity to paint what is truly an incredible and wonderful expectation for the coming year. Lord, an entire year is laid out before us. And each and every day that you would give us breath, may it be that we would use that breath to sing your praise. Oh Lord, that we would focus on you, that we would realize that our steps are measured, that they're directed by you, leading us into and guiding us through that which brings you honor and you glory. And Lord, it's good. It's good. Not always good for us at the moment, Lord, but it's certainly good for the kingdom. And you'll mean it for good in our lives as we'll stay faithful and we'll stay drawn towards you. So, Lord, for everyone that's here, I just ask you to just bless them, give them clear insight into how it is that they can walk anew in you in this new year. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.